Ah. Hello, dear friends. Welcome to this new book, Titanic. Now, one of the reasons I picked this up is that as I was flipping through it in the shop, I realized Titanic is one of the most famous ships in history. And we think we know about it, but actually when you stop for a moment, it's really only the disaster, the tragedy. Of course, made very popular by the seminal 1997 movie Titanic, James Cameron directing Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet, of course. And the travels to the bottom of the sea to view the wreckage, some of which, as we know, have resulted in tragedy. The ship continues to claim more lives to this day. But when I flip through this book, as you'll see, it actually takes us through the construction, the birth of the ship, how it was made up, what it did in life, its death, its aftermath. So I think this will be a great opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about the ship, its people, and life on and around it, to just get greater context to the disaster. So we have the birth, and this is of course the ship here in its shipyard being constructed without its famous uh, chimneys or funnels. Get a real sense of the scale of the ship with these individuals standing on the front of it there. Just absolutely huge ship. So that was the launch in 1911. And on the left of it, there was her third sister ship, the Arlanza, that was under construction. This is the Olympics double bottom during construction. It's fascinating, isn't it? I've never really thought much about shipbuilding in the past. But, um, yes, if I think about archaeological digs and the remains of, say, Viking longships, it's interesting. You, you, you see this kind of fossil, this skeleton of a ship often unearthed, don't you? So the dramatic story of the Titanic is inextricably bound up with that of its owners, the White Star Line, and with the history of the transatlantic shipping route. So for almost 400 years, following the early voyages of discovery, the traffic between Europe and America grew steadily, despite many wars involving the US, Britain, France, and Spain. And by the early 19th century, a substantial trade involving both passengers and cargo had built up all carried by sailing ships, which were completely at the mercy of the elements. That typical crossing could easily take a month or more, a regular timetable being totally impossible. Of course, the introduction of steam power radically altered the timetable here in the picture, but it wasn't until 1840 that the first purpose-designed steam-powered transatlantic liners were built. The British Cunard Line, which was founded in 1839, introduced the Britannia that set off on its maiden transatlantic voyage in 1840, carried up to 115 passengers and took 12 days and 10 hours from the crossing from Liverpool to Halifax. The first American transatlantic passenger steamship was the Washington. It's, um, Fascinating, isn't it, to think about how seafaring must have been before steam. What, one thing that's always amazed me is the Viking settlers in Finland, who must have been in a very exposed longship, sailing across the transatlantic for a very long time, all powered. Incredible feat of human endurance and perseverance. This is the Olympic during its construction, and it's alongside the Titanic's keel which was laid on the 31st of March, 1909. And here is a view of the fully plated Olympic alongside the Titanic, which is fully framed. It's a huge undertaking, isn't it, all of this scaffolding? So, we've got an issue here where 
major disaster already occurred with the White Star Line in 1873, when the Atlantic, sister ship to the Oceanic, was lost after striking a rock off Halifax in Nova Scotia. It had been battered by a storm that caused coal consumption to be increased, to the extent that her master, Captain James Williams, became concerned about his ability to reach New York, an altered course to call at Halifax. Due to a major navigational error, the ship was well west of her calculated position and ran aground on rocks near the shore, only 15 miles from her destination. No fewer than 546 people, many of them children, died in this horrific occurrence, which at the time was the worst marine accident on record. That's terrible, isn't it? You'd think that just running aground on rocks, only 15 miles from your destination, it's so devastating. At the subsequent court of inquiry, one of the incidental causes of the accident was attributed to the fact that the ship did not carry enough coal safely to complete her voyage in circumstances which could reasonably have been foreseen. Although the White Star Line vehemently disputed this finding, and over the years that followed, the White Star Line's safety record was such as to cause concern, even by the standards of the time when accidental shipping losses were at a much greater level than today. The six and a half thousand ton Neuronic, then the world's largest livestock carrier, disappeared without trace on a North Atlantic crossing in 1893, while the liner Germanic capsized in New York Harbour in 1899 because of the weight of ice on her upper works. It was salvaged and then put back into service. In 1907, the Swevik ran aground near Land's End in Cornwall when nearing the end of a voyage from Australia and lost over 200 foot off the forward section of the hull before being towed off and repaired. In 1909, the liner Republic sank after a collision with the liner Florida, although almost all the passengers and crew were saved due to one of the earliest recorded incidents of a radio distress call being successfully transmitted. Now, I didn't know that the White Star Line had such a track record with disasters. If you think about it in this day and age, would you board a plane with an airline that is consistently crashing its craft? I don't think I would. And it almost makes that statement of it being unsinkable somewhat perverse. Just a, a, a marketing trick to almost paper over their, their poor track record. Here are some of the thousands of men that were employed by Harland and Wolf returning home down Queen's Road in Belfast. You can see right here in a faded distance the Titanic's bow, is, its bow is visible. And here we have the design of the Britannic watertight inner shell, which proved to be a mistake. It contributed to a disastrous end, and res retrospectively the Olympics was extended to above the waterline as shown above. I look at that with a bit of fondness, actually, because um, in a former life I was an actor and uh, I appeared in a dramatised documentary about the Britannic. I think it was called something like Britannic Titanic's uh, Tragic Twin. And I played, um, I delivered the account of an unknown sailor who would have been just like this guy here, underneath the bow, talking about the water flooding in and the, the chaos that ensued. So while the Oceanic was doing much to restore the White Star Line's good name, the company underwent a significant change of ownership when it was purchased in 1902 by the International Mercantile Marine Company for the sum of £10 million. Uh, it was um, a shipping conglomerate constructed by its owner, J. Pierpont Morgan, J.P. Morgan, of course, an American tycoon who had single-handedly built up his business to become the largest private banking house in America before diversifying into railways, steel making and shipping. So we know J.P. Morgan, of course, to this day dominates many financial sector skylines. Ten million pounds in 1902 must have been an absolutely astronomical sum of money. So while these complex business transactions were being planned and executed, the transatlantic passenger trade was booming as the United States sought to increase its population and its strength as a nation. It offered unrestricted freedom of immigration to citizens of all nations, 
and had calls answered by the citizens of almost all European countries, many of whom were racked by war, civil strife, religious persecution, or sheer poverty. Their hundreds of thousands of them were attracted by the promise of a life of freedom in a vast new country where individual labour and enterprise could bring untold rewards. While the continuing tale some greatly exaggerated of fortunes being made from sensational strikes of gold, silver and other minerals also fed the demand for a passage to the bold new world. By the turn of the century, the major seafaring nations strove to grab the lion's share of this lucrative market, and the main contenders were the mercantile fleets of Britain and Germany, echoing the massive naval armaments race, which was also in progress at the time and eventually led to war in 1914. I mean, it is appealing, isn't it? Particularly if you've got difficult circumstances back home, and essentially there is a country that is, in, for all intents and purposes, new, and it's massive. There's space for so many people, and it's a blank check for opportunity. You can see why it's such an enduring allure, even to this day. As a massive anchor, 15 and a half tons being taken to the ship for the Olympic. These poor horses having to lug around a 15 and a half ton anchor. And we have the Olympic's port and centre propellers here again, gigantic. Look at the size of those, these um, individuals standing by just one of the propeller fans. This is its rudder and propellers during outfitting. And this is the Titanic's tail shaft being fitted just prior to her launch. So we've got a bit of a race going on, Germany, US and Britain, what was going on in Britain while all this was happening. So as usual, the British government was slow to wake up to the fact that its merchant marine fleet, the very lifeblood of the country and its enormous empire, was either being outbuilt by the Germans or taken over by the Americans. It was Morgan's purchase of the White Star Line that finally galvanised the politicians into action. Parliament quickly approved a bill that gave the Cunard Line subsidies to buy up built two liners that would restore British prestige. So in return, the line undertook to remain British-owned, and the ships incorporated features that would allow them to be used as troop ships or armed merchant cruisers in time of war. And the result of this deal was two ships, which for different reasons became household names. So the first was the ill-fated Lusitania, which had a notorious demise. Of course, it was sunk without warning by a German U-boat in May 1915. But her early career was much more pleasing, quickly rewarded her owners and builders when she regained the blue ribbon for Britain with an average speed of 23.61 kts on her. Uh, not, I suppose, on her second westward voyage in 1907. She was the world's largest liner as well as being the fastest. Handsome slim lines were complemented by four evenly spaced raked funnels that gave an air of speed even when at anchor. As the crew became familiar with the operation of her advanced machinery, new steam turbines geared to quadruple screws, the ship's performance steadily improved to the extent that average speeds on the transatlantic run rose to over 26 knots. Although the Germans and Americans had no answer to this sort of performance, the second ship of the British pair eventually proved to have the edge in terms of sheer performance, which was the Mauritania, which by a very small margin was longer, it was heavier. sister on her maiden eastbound voyage she showed that she was also slightly faster making the crossing at an average of 23.69 knots so from then until 1914 the two great canadas engaged in friendly rivalry until the mauritania set an average of 26.6 knots in september 1909 which wasn't broken until 1929 by the new german liner the bremen but that's another story the ships didn't stint on the luxury stakes. They could carry 560 first, 475 second, and 1,300 third class passengers at fares ranging from over 200 pounds in first to around 20 pounds in steerage. So these figures comparing in real terms with the sort of money that today's travellers might pay for a crossing by supersonic Concord or by the cheapest economy airfare respectively. Rest in peace Concord. This was obviously the Concord existed at time of writing. Here are two of Titanic's engines nearing completion here. Big old engine.
dimensions, look at the size of them, that's one there, there's the other, these are the Olympics massive boilers awaiting installation, I don't know if you can see that but there is a person standing there and the size in terms of perspective that person is the size of my finger point, my fingertip compared to these absolutely huge hulking um, technology. As is always the case, things advance and get bigger and stronger because of competition, really, particularly between nations. Here's the Olympics launch on October the 20th, 1910. Look at that. Look at the shape. It's a very elegant looking ship, isn't it? Here's the Olympic during her removal to the outfitting dock with the Titanic in the background over there, which is still in the slipway. So the Olympic here was first of its class, had much longer and more successful career, and her story impinges on that of the Titanic at several points. The Olympic keel was laid down as number 400 at the Harland and Wolfs Belfast shipyard on December the 16th, 1908, while work on the Titanic keel number 401 commenced on the adjacent slipway on March the 31st, 1909. So work on the two giants progressed rapidly, massive hulls being straddled by an enormous gantry crane, the largest in the world at that time, which lifted and positioned the thousands of tons of steel plates and girders used in the construction. By 1910, the Olympic was ready for launching. I mean, the, the turnaround of this production is, what, two years? Two, three years for these absolutely gigantic sea fairing vessels, which is an incredible technological feat, really. I mean, where I live, it's taken about 10 years for the first ground to just be broken on building a leisure centre and swimming pool in our town. It's, um, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's that's a story for another day, isn't it? I suppose that's a political one, a lot of things have grown, grown to a halt when it comes to progress compared to here. So on completion of celebrations, the Olympics sailed for Liverpool. After a brief stay, it carried on to Southampton where the White Star Line established its main terminal for transatlantic services since 1907. The ship's maiden voyage was fully booked, with travellers eager, eager to sample the world's largest liner, and subsequently under the command of Captain Edward Smith, she settled into a routine that was based around a three-week cycle. It started with a seven-day voyage to New York that included calls at Cherbourg and Queenstown in Ireland, a three and a half day turnaround at New York, followed by the return voyage, which called at Plymouth and Cherbourg before reaching Southampton. Further three and a half days was spent preparing the ship for the next voyage that started each third Wednesday. That pattern was shared with the Majestic and Oceanic, which enabled the White Star Line to maintain a weekly return service across the Atlantic. The timetable was rudely interrupted on Wednesday, September the 20th, 1911, when the Olympics set off from Southampton for her fifth revenue-earning voyage, still under the command of Captain Smith. As she made her stately way down the Solent and headed out to pass around the east end of the Isle of Wight, she worked up to a spanking 18 knots, but was nominally under the direction of George Bowyer, a very experienced Trinity House pilot. As she turned to starboard and around the Bramble Bank, speed was reduced to 11 knots, but the wide radius of her turn surprised the commander of HMS Hawk, a rather ancient 7,000-ton cruiser that was unable to take sufficient avoiding action. The two ships collided, the cruiser's steel and concrete bow ram burying itself deep into the starboard quarter of the great liner. Fortunately, nobody was killed, both ships remained afloat. The Olympic made it back to Southampton on one engine, despite two major watertight compartments being completely flooded. This sorry incident resulted in a celebrated legal argument, argument that decided that the fault lay with the Olympic, and although the ship was technically under the control of the pilot, the White Star Line was faced with large legal costs, as well as the cost of repairing the ship, and the losses resulting from the disruption of services. One apparent source of solace was that the ship had survived a major collision. The Hawk was designed to sink enemy ships by ramming them, and it had remained afloat and stable despite serious flooding. 
Perhaps that seemed to vindicate the design of the Olympic class and it lend credence to the myth that they were unsinkable. Interesting. That's something that I didn't know and now makes a little bit more sense in context. Just hearing the statement, this ship is unsinkable, please ride with us, seems a bit, well, it's a ship, surely it is sinkable if certain conditions arise, but actually one of these ships had been put to the test in that respect, so the public consciousness could have been reassured by that, I suppose. This is the view of the Fur Olympics boat deck during construction, taken in 1911, and on the same day another view of it during outfitting, showing only one funnel in place. This is looking after the Olympics poop deck during outfitting. So we have here an image of Titanic stern just before launch, which gives a good indication of the height of the ship and the fearsome distance people would be forced to jump as the stern continued to rise as it plummeted to the seabed. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Absolutely gargantuan. This is a person. I mean, it looks like, I mean, well, I suppose you could count these as stories, couldn't you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably eight, nine, maybe ten stories. Like jumping off the roof of a ten-story office block to jump into the sea, that is terrifying. The decisions that these people had to make in a moment of terror are absolutely chilling to the bone. This is the bow just before launch. And this is a rare view of the Titanic during outfitting. She only has three funnels here. The fourth, which was the dummy, would be added later. So while the Olympic was hitting the headlines in 1911, work on the Titanic pressed ahead during the interruptions. As already related, and as might be expected, she was launched amid great publicity on the 31st of May 1911. The weather was fitting for the occasion, clear skies and sunshine. Although a stiff breeze blew up the, um, the luff from the south, causing the many flags, pennants and ensigns to stand out and add to the air of excitement. And this is it immediately after launch, and then moved to Thompson Wharf for fitting out, so it doesn't have its famous funnels there. And this is it during fitting out, I mean, yeah, look, the funnels do add such a distinctive um, silhouette, don't they? So the alterations to B deck to accommodate two private promenade suites can be seen. And the funnels aren't painted yet. Yeah, you can see the promenade decks there, there's one there. So celebrations completed, work continued on the immense task of fitting out the ship. This was originally scheduled to have been completed by March 19. But with all the important maiden commercial voyage advertised as departing from Southampton on the 20th of that month, I bet it was at a timetable disrupted by the Olympics' return to Belfast for repairs, which meant it had to be moved out of the graving dock, but also that men were transferred to a damaged sister in order to carry out the necessary work. So a new in-service date of April 10th, 1912 was announced, and work went ahead at full speed as soon as the Olympics sailed again at the end of November 1911. By the following January, the Titanic was almost externally complete. All four funnels were in place, but there was a considerable amount of internal work to be done. In almost every respect, the Titanic and the Olympic were absolutely identical. Consequently, there are numerous instances of confusion and mistaken identities. In fact, a, a great proportion of postcards and photographs purporting to show the Titanic, particularly those which show the interior of the ship and her cabins, actually illustrate her sister ship. It was only in the latter stages of fitting out that an addition was made to the Titanic that served to differentiate the two ships. Following the initial experience with the Olympic and the personal instigation of Bruce Ismay, a steel framed screen equipped with sliding windows was fitted to the forward half of the promenade on a deck, which were intended to provide additional shelter from the weather for first class passengers. Although the windows were normally bolted shut, could only be opened with a special spanner. It had been speculated that these screens could have impeded access to the lifeboats being lowered from above. It was ready for sea trials, despite all of these last-minute additions on April the 1st, 1912, but they were delayed till the following day due to adverse weather conditions. So it does seem like there are a lot of ill omens 
fateful portent, portents of, of its future here. Lovely images here. Here are the um, Titanic's lifeboats that are installed, but uh, promenade deck hasn't been enclosed yet. And here it is lying completed in Belfast Love. During early March 1912, the Olympic returned to Belfast. Having lost a propeller blade, Titanic was moved from the Thompson graving dock so that the necessary repairs could be carried out on the sister ship. And this is the last time you would see them together. So majestic. So during the day trials, the White Star Line had been represented by one of their directors, Harold Sanderson, Holland and Wolf by Lord Peary's nephew, Thomas Andrews, and also by Edward Wilding and a team of nine other specialists known as the Guarantee Group. As was common practice on such occasions, the latter group would stay aboard the ship, at least for the maiden voyage, in order to be on hand to assist with rectifying any faults or problems that might occur. Other important personage who accompanied the initial sea, sea trials and no idle spectator was the Board of Trade's representative and surveyor, Francis Carruthers. It was he who, on the return to Belfast at the end of the busy day of trials, signed the Titanic's official certificate of seaworthiness, which was necessary before the ship was allowed to carry fair-paying passengers. With this accomplished, Harland and Wolfe officially handed the ship over to the White Star Line. Sanderson and Andrews conducted the necessary formalities and exchange of documents. After this was completed, and with the crew at their stations, the Titanic slipped from her mooring just after 8pm and sailed out into the Irish Sea, leaving Belfast forever and setting course for her home port of Southampton, where she arrived just before midnight on the night of April the 3rd. During the 570-mile voyage, further trials and tests were carried out, and at one point the ship had worked up to 23.25 knots, the fastest speed she is known ever to have attained. On arrival at Southampton, she was met by five tugs that skillfully turned her in midstream, and then manoeuvred her stern into berth 44 at the White Star Dock. The Titanic had arrived. Fascinating start there, so the anatomy of the Titanic. Wonderful image here of what looks like a dining room or a smoking room or a leisure room, a leisure room for our first class passengers, no doubt. Yes, that was the first class lounge. And here we have promotional material providing a stylized sectional view of the sister ships. So, that's interesting. It's a very informative advert, isn't it? Here's a little cross-section. So the sight that greeted the inhabitants of Southampton as dawn broke on the April the 4th was of a massive but beautiful and graceful ship finished in the white star line colours. A black hole with red boot topping at the waterline, white superstructure and upper works, and a yellow and gold band around the hull at main deck level and yellow masts and buff funnels. For such a large and new ship, the construction of the hull was relatively simple and traditional. A combination of transverse frames and longitudinal girders built up from the keel provided the framework on which the hull still plating was riveted. The vertical transverse frames were spaced three feet apart along the whole length of the hull, except in the bow and stern areas where the interval was reduced to two feet to give increased strength in vulnerable areas. The plates were almost an inch thick, held in place by literally millions of rivets that accounted alone for some 1,500 tons of the ship's final displacement. Of particular interest in view of subsequent events are the provisions incorporated to maintain buoyancy in the event of the hull being pierced and the internal flooding occurring. The main safety feature in this respect was the division of the hull in two separate zones or compartments by no fewer than 15 transverse watertight bulkheads, each incorporating watertight doors that could be closed by operating a single electric switch on the bridge. In the event of a collision, the main hazard envisaged, the Titanic was designed to stay afloat with at least any two compartments completely flooded and would probably float in calm conditions. 
conditions with up to four filled with water. There were no longitudinal watertight bulkheads, a deliberate omission that ensured the ship would not list unduly of hold. These arrangements seemed justified by the aftermath of the collision between the Olympic and the cruiser Hawk, when, although seriously hauled, the former was never in any danger of sinking. Although neither Harland and Wolfe nor the White Star Line ever claimed that the Titanic or her sisters were unsinkable, they were both confident that they would survive all known hazards, and that their size, strength and design made them as safe as humanly possible. Neither concerned at anything that to demolish the popular myth that held that these latest and greatest manifestations of man's creativity and engineering ability were indestructible. So that's interesting. The claim didn't come from the company itself. It was just part of what people chose to believe. Interesting. Here we have a highly detailed elevation and depth plans for the Titanic taken from the original construction plans. It's most easily distinguished from her sister ship Olympic by the partial glazing of the forward third of the promenade deck. This was added after sea trial observations on the latter showed that passengers who wanted to stroll on the promenade deck would do so in greater comfort if they were protected from the elements in bad weather and rough sea conditions. Now, what was to prove a fatal flaw in the design of the compartments formed by the watertight bulkheads? They were not, in themselves, independently watertight. There was no covering watertight deck to cap them, as was included in the contemporary Cunard liners, Lusitania and Mauritania. So the effect of this was that if water actually filled the uh, compartment above the top of the watertight bulkhead, it would flow into the adjoining compartment and flood that one as well. So that was one of the factors that contributed to the loss of the fit uh, ship. At the time of its construction, the designers assumed that this couldn't happen because all the bulkheads were carried up to levels above the waterline, although seven of them only rose to E-deck level. And the remainder of the eight bulkheads extended further to the underside of D-deck. This arrangement provided a free board of two and a half feet to three feet to, to the water margin lines as against the modern requirement of just three inches. So this meant eight extended to the underside of D-deck and seven extended to the underside of E-deck. Two of the taller bulkheads were concentrated in the bow to cater for a possible collision, while the lower ones tended to be concentrated amidships, dividing the various boiler and machinery spaces. So the upper, or E-deck, was the lowest deck in which it was possible to traverse the whole length of the ship at one level. And although pierced by the three boiler uptakes and part of the main engine casing, it contained considerably more accommodation and public spaces than the decks below. Right in the bow were crew spaces, housing seamen and coal trimmers, as well as a few third-class cabins and toilet facilities, while the stern section carried more second- and third-class cabins. Amidships, the entire starboard side of the ship was taken up with sumptuous first-class cabins, while the port side housed the hundreds of stewards and waiters who formed a significant portion of the total crew. A long straight passageway flanking the port side of the boiler uptakes was known as the Scotland Road and provided access to the crew accommodation. It also included the engineer's mess. Here it is again, lying completed in Belfast Lough. This is the Olympic starboard boat deck showing four second-class lifeboats. Mention of the boat deck leads to a consideration of the lifeboats carried by the Titanic, a matter that raised considerable controversy, the controversy in the immediate aftermath of the sinking. So at the time of the disaster, the ship carried a total of 20 lifeboats, of which 14 were of a standard design, capable of carrying approximately 65 people, two emergency cutters that were permanently swung out and could carry 40 people, and four collapsible Engelhardt lifeboats carrying 47 people. Readers with a mathematical inclination will have worked out that the total capacity of all of these came to A1178, a figure well short of 3,300 passengers and crew, which the ship was certified to carry a fully loaded. 
scandalous as this might seem, this meagre provision not only complied with, but actually exceeded the official Board of Trade's requirements at the time. So there was two reasons for that. The first was, as often happens, government regulations failed to keep up with the headlong advances in technology, so that by the time the 46 great dun ships like the Titanic were being laid down, the rules were based on the 10,000 great dun ships being built almost 20 years before. And the second was the whole philosophy behind the new breed of liners that mean that even in the worst case they would take some time to sink. Other vessels would have been in the vicinity and helped because of radio, etc. And the lifeboats would not have to serve as a refuge for those on board, but just to ferry survivors to other ships which had come to the rescue. So with this in mind, there were more than enough lifeboats for everyone. But these would be of little use if a survivor had no lifeboat to which he could swim once in the water. The hollow thinking behind this state of affairs was to be sadly exposed on the night of April 14th, 1912. Oh dear, that's so sad, isn't it? It's also sad to think that it's being, you know, yes, you're exceeding what the legal requirements are, but it's just paper pushing, isn't it? Pen pushing. It's not considering. Are we absolutely sure that we could save all souls on board? No, it's about fulfilling a bureaucratic form. It's not thinking about the human, is it? Which is, which is a shame. And you see that to this very day. All of these considerations, though, were probably far from the thoughts of the passengers who were preparing to board it for its maiden voyage. They'd be eagerly anticipating the privilege and thrill of travelling in the world's largest and supposedly safest liner, looking forward to sampling the luxurious facilities that had been so widely publicised. First-class passengers could look forward to a week of comfort and opulence, which at least equalled and probably even exceeded anything they were familiar with ashore. To these passengers, the ship was nothing more than a prestigious five-star floating hotel, complete with all the services and amenities that you would expect from such an establishment. The accommodation that had attracted the most publicity would have been the two millionaire suites on B-deck, which consisted of two bedrooms with bathroom and dressing facilities between them. And here we have some images. These are the Olympics gymnasium windows, and one of the cranes used to stow cargo. Here we have the Olympics port side boat deck looking at the ship's compass tower. And here we have the Olympics bridge looking towards the starboard wing. And this is where Officer Murdoch and Captain Smith would have seen the iceberg after the collision. On the Titanic, of course, not the Olympic, and this is from the forecastle deck, looking towards the bridge. So, the ship's bow. Um, there. Titanic's was recovered from its wreck site. Continuing with those rooms, the larger of the bedrooms was carpeted, oak panelled and decorated in French style, containing a large double and single bed, together with various pieces of furniture, including a washstand, dressing table and sofa. The other bedroom was of a similar size and content, but was decorated in a different style. The sitting room was expansively fitted out and furnished with a large round table, armchairs, occasional chairs, writing desk, coffee stool rather incongruously a fireplace and mantelpiece. And each of these two suites had access to a private veranda, equipped with chairs, settees and tables, both of which had a servant cabin and a private pantry immediately adjacent. Wow. Everything was furnished in a variety of decorative styles culled from the stately homes of Europe, including Louis the Fifteenth um, and Sixteenth Adams and Empire styles. This is the uh, first-class swimming pool here, and the Olympics there, which show just how close the sister ships were in layout and construction. They were also the first ocean liners to offer swimming pools to travellers. This is the Olympic smoke room, boasting a mahogany panelling with mother-of-pearl inlay and magnificent stained glass windows. So opulent, so regal. So when boarding the ship, the first-class passengers would immediately come into the impressive entrance hall on B-deck, 
where they would be confronted by the 16-foot wide grand staircase that accessed six decks and was over 60 feet high. It's capped at its upper level by a massive glass dome, lit by a massive 21 light chandelier. So for those passengers unable or unwilling to climb the staircase, there were three electric lifts available. Amidships on A deck was the reading and writing room. Lower down on D deck and easily accessible from the grand staircase was the reception room, which extended the whole width of the ship, carpeted heavily with the best quality Axminster on the wall opposite the stairs, a specially commissioned French tapestry. The passengers were hungry. They had a choice of places to eat, ranging from the grand dining saloon, also on D deck, which could seat 550, was claimed to be the largest compartment aboard any liner in the world, to the à la carte restaurant in the Café Parisien on B deck. The grand saloon was expensively decorated in a mock 17th century Jacobean style, with the à la carte adopting a more expensive Louis XVI look. The sentry located on the upper promenade deck was the smoking room that was loosely based on English country houses of the early Georgian period, and as women were not expected to smoke in those days, it was effectively a gentleman's retreat, rather like the uh, London clubs they would have reluctantly have left behind. For those with a more energetic turn of mind, there was a novel 32 foot by 13 foot swimming pool, fully tiled in white and blue. Special periods of each day were set aside for female bathers. And even more intriguing was the Turkish and electric bath establishment, situated immediately aft of the swimming pool, done out in a pastiche of a 17th century Arabian style with ornate carvings and original tiling. Hot um, and temperate sauna rooms were available together with electric Turkish baths, a full staff of attendants and a masseuses to ease weary limbs. customers might well have been using some of the sport facilities on the ship, including the full-size squash court, which the White Star Line publicity placed great store, as it offered a concrete example of how steady and spacious the Titanic actually was. A full-time professional coach was in attendance, and a regular program of competitions would have been arranged on each voyage. Then finally on the boat deck, the gymnasium was provided with the latest gadgets and exercising equipment, including rowing and weightlifting machines, and perhaps the pleasures of riding on a horseback while skimming across the ocean um, could be simulated at over 20 knots. If the first class passengers were well looked after, those in second class would have little to complain about. Although smaller, the cabins were reasonably spacious, normally configured to hold two or four sleeping berths. They contained large wardrobes and ingenious fold-away washstands. None had an ensuite bath or toilet facilities. They were provided in special areas in the center line of the ship. Here we have the Olympics reading and writing room. Looks very lovely. Very calm, very serene. And this is the Olympics first class palm court overlooking the promenade deck aft, which led into the first class smoking room. This is another angle of that and this is of course very famous now this is the olympics first class staircase showing the clock featuring honor and glory crowning time part of the beautiful glass dome can be seen and i'm guessing the interior was exactly the same for the titanic because of course in the movie titanic this centerpiece of course was featured often in many of the scenes wonderful large image here of that reading and writing room just sailing across the sea beautiful light being let in of course wonderful chairs armchairs footstools writing bureau over there one over there too wonderful could you imagine just being served a coffee looking out onto an endless expanse of sea and writing your missives your journals your letters to those that you loved Here's the second class smoke room on the Olympic. So both the Olympic and Titanic second class accommodation arrival that, that of first class on most other ships. Still looks very nice. Looks a bit like a pub. <laughs> Here's the extravagantly panelled and furnished Louis XVI style sitting room belonging to a first class parlour suite. 
so the lot of third class or steerage passengers was thought of as arduous, cramped and uncomfortable. So this might have been true on earlier ships, but the builders of the Titanic attempted to provide a much improved style of accommodation in this area. The vast majority of such para passengers were emigrants from Europe who were intent on starting a new life in America. So the voyage across the Atlantic was literally a once in a lifetime experience that the White Star Line did its best to make as pleasant as possible. I guess the, the previous view is third class, you are just literally paying for passage, so put up with a small space and just get on with it, I suppose. Public areas were open and spacious. The decor was simple and straightforward, generally white painted, pine panelled or plain bulkheads with wooden furniture. But despite this, meals were still served by stewards and waiters, plenty of food available. A typical day's menu lists porridge, fish, eggs, tripe and onions, bread, butter, marmalade, tea and coffee for breakfast, soup, rabbit, bacon, beans, potatoes, biscuits, bread, semolina and apples for lunch, and brawn beef, cheese, pickles, bread, butter, jam, tea and buns at tea time. Accommodation was mostly in twin berth cabins with basic wash facilities, bunks folded away to give more space in the day. Electric lighting was provided. So although it was rather spartan, they weren't uncomfortable, and the design was well thought out. And the provision of twin berth cabins for this class of passenger was very unusual at this time. Many other ships sleeping steerage passengers in four or eight berth cabins, even in communal dormitories. So at the time of her loss, the Titanic was manned by a crew of 892, the majority of which were accommodated on E-deck. Although 108 firemen were berthed right forward under the forecastle, and another 140, including more firemen and the third class stewards, were down on F and G decks. The crew's accommodation and messing arrangements were completely segregated from the ship's passengers. They had their own passageways, staircases to move through the ship as their duties required. When the ship set sail from Belfast, she had been manned by a crew of approximately 120 which was enough to handle the ship on her short run to Southampton, and the rest of the crew signed on. The man appointed to command this floating marvel of the age was the White Star Line's Commodore, Captain Edward John Smith, who, despite his seniority within the company, did not have an unblemished record. Born in 1850, he went to sea at the age of 13, joined the White Star Line as a junior officer in 1880, gaining his first command in 1887. Only two years later, he was involved in a serious incident when the ship he was in command of, the Republic, ran aground off New York. It was embarrassingly stranded for several hours before being refloated. And on the same day, three crewmen were killed in a boiler accident. In 1890, he again ran a ship aground near Rio de Janeiro. But his career continued and he commanded several troop ships during the Boer War. So these services resulted in the awarding of a medal and a commission in the Royal Naval Reserve as a commander, which was a distinction that allowed any merchant ship under his command to fly the blue ensign instead of the red ensign normally thrown by British merchant ships. So in 1901, aboard the Majestic, again, in 1906 aboard the Baltic, his ships experienced serious onboard fires. And in November 1909, he again ran aground, this time in the White Star Line's flagship Adriatic in the Ambrose Channel near New York. When the Olympic entered service in 1911, he continued this amazing record by almost crashing a tug while berthing at New York, and was in command on both the occasions already described when the Olympic was forced to return to Belfast for repairs. Nevertheless, the company appeared to have no hesitation in appointing him to command the Titanic when it was ready for sea. Although sources indicate he was due to retire on completion of the return maiden voyage. I mean, pardon, excuse me, I didn't know that, uh, if I think back to what I remember of the movie, I seem to remember the captain being a somewhat tragic figure, somebody who would go down with the ship, maybe, am I misremembering that? I mean, he sounds awful. Like, he, what did he know about somebody in power? <laughs> he seems to have been continually failing upwards. And again, it was the more I'm reading, the more it feels like the Titanic wasn't an accident. It was a 
preventable based on a complete combination of factors that were inevitably going to lead to disaster, perhaps. This is another view of the writing room and a first-class reception room, a popular meeting place leading into the dining room. Smith's second-in-command on the Titanic's maiden voyage was Chief Officer Henry Tingle Wild, one of the best names I think I've ever seen. Tingle Wild. Aged 38, he was formerly Chief Officer of the Olympic. He could reasonably have been expected to have remained aboard the ship in order to assist its new captain on its first voyage, but for reasons that had never been satisfactorily explained. He was transferred to the Titanic at short notice, didn't board until the day immediately prior to sailing. April the 9th. This caused a reshuffle amongst the deck officers that were already appointed, probably some resentment as well. The original chief officer, William McMaster Murdoch, was demoted to the position of first officer. Same happened to Charles Herbert Lightdollar, who became second officer instead of his original appointment as first officer. So everyone's been shunted down because of this last minute change. And apart from the crew, there were two other men on board who would play a very important part in the events about to unfold. So although wireless equipment had only recently been introduced aboard ships at sea, its usefulness was dramatically illustrated following the collision between the Linus Republic and Florida in 1909. The radio distress message alerted other ships so there was little loss of life. Consequently, all new ships were being equipped with wireless, although many smaller and older ships remained without. The Titanic provided with a set that had a normal range of around 250 miles, but it could be boosted by atmospheric conditions to significantly greater distances. Power was provided by a 5 kilowatt generator, a diesel powered standby, batteries available as alternative backups. The radio room was incorporated into the bridge. Superstructure at the base of the fore funnel, manned by two operators who were not employed by the White Star Line but by the Marconi International Marine Communication Company. Um, Guglielmo Marconi was not only a brilliant inventor but an astute businessman. He recognized the importance of his invention and he kept a personal hold on its deployment and use. So the two operators were Jack Phillips and his assistant Harold Bride. These two continually manned the set and while at sea on six hours on, six hours off shift pattern. And another group not directly employed by White Star but were to earn an undying fame in the days to come joined the ship at Southampton in expectation of a routine job. These were the eight musicians hired from a Liverpool agency whose task would be to entertain the passengers in the various restaurants and saloons. Little did they realise that their final performance would be in the most dramatic circumstances imaginable. And of course those that group have been uh, immortalised in the movie as well. This is the first class a la carte restaurant panelled in French walnut with gilded detail. On the Titanic on Sunday, April 14th, just prior to the disaster, Captain Smith was being entertained in the restaurant by Mr and Mrs Widener. This is the Titanic's first class bedroom, B-57. Interesting. Not as spacious as I thought it might be. This is the first, this is the first class bedroom in B-64 and one in B-38. Okay, we seem to be increasing in luxury a little bit here. A four poster bed. I mean, a four poster bed screams first class to me. I don't know about you guys. We have one of the Olympics 10 kilowatt lifts with electric motor. Out there, that's the motor. And the electrical distribution box concealed behind panelling. Over here we have the younger first class passengers that ensured that uh, the informal cafe Parisian was always popular. And the first class dining room at the Olympic here. Wonderful ceilings. Here we have the main generating set in the engine room. And one of the warren of passageways used by crew members on their way to the deck. Seems a bit claustrophobic, doesn't it? This is one of the Olympics washrooms. This is the second class staircase. Quite nice. And the Olympics third class staircase with the general room on the left and the smoke room on the right. Not too bad. Nice space. 
spaciousness there. Then we are going to move on to life on board the Titanic. Got an image here of um, a young boy playing with a spinning top or something. So I think that's a good opportunity to put a pin in this episode. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about the Titanic's creation and the somewhat ominous stories leading to its launch. I look forward to having you join me next time for the life and times, brief times of the Titanic.